Why are teddy bears never hungry? They're always stuffed. You know, my wife is forcing me to fix her hair for a reggae party. I'm dreading it. <laughs> Want to hear a joke about paper? Never mind, it's terrible. Come on, people are sending me so many jokes now, I'm, I'm starting to create a file, so there you go. All right, we've been talking about words for the last, what, seven weeks or so, and we've talked about God is good, God is true, God is hope, God is love, God is holy, God is all-powerful, and God is just. Well, today we're going to bring this uh, portion, my portion of the, the uh, sermon series on words to a conclusion, and I wanted to end this uh, with, a, with a different perspective. And the words up until now have described the nature of God, the very nature of his being. And, uh, and we've used all of those words in, a, in an appropriate way to describe God as each of those things. But today our key word is the key word to a letter that was written to the New Testament church. Uh, it's called Hebrews, and it was written mainly to people who had a full understanding of the Hebrew scriptures and the Hebrew worship system with the temple and all that kind of stuff. So if you ever get lost, just read the book from beginning to end, then reread it, and, and what you'll find out is there's a lot of things in the Old Testament that he's pulling on to make his points in the New Testament. And uh, you do need to be acquainted with the the parts of the Bible before Matthew, if you really want to understand the promises we have in God. But this key word is a key word of the letter of the book of Hebrews. It wasn't written by Paul. The, the early church fathers didn't even say it was written by Paul. Um, it was probably written by somebody who was a traveling companion who was Jewish in background. My personal belief is probably written by a guy like Apollos, who we find out was a great uh, uh, rhetorician. He was, he was great at rhetoric and he was great at speaking. And this letter to the book of Hebrews is actually, it's one of his sermons just sort of written down on paper. And if I'd done it justice today, I would have just stood up and read you the entire book of Hebrews and given you no commentary because it's a standalone alone sermon. But I think there's some things we need to have explained to us and made point uh, from. But the theme of this book is that, remember, it's written to Hebrew Christians and, and early Gentile Christians that were in a predominantly Hebrew setting. So they understood the Old Testament or the, the portion of the Bible, you know, this much of the Bible was what they, they had as their scriptures, and they understood this well. And what he's saying is, is that this is good, and this understanding of God is good, but his word is better. Everybody say the word with me together. It is better. Say it with me. Better. Come on, one, two, three. Better. Now, to help you understand this, we're going to read a text today from the book of Hebrews. And let's go Hebrews chapter 11, verse 40. Would you stand to your feet in honor of God's word? And uh, can I have that back there? Hebrews eleven forty 40 says this. God had planned something what? Better for us. Can we read that together? Everybody together. You ready? God had planned something better for us. So God had a relationship with the people in the old covenant, Israel. He had a relationship with them. And as we found out when we were talking about holy, that relationship is defined by the Old Testament scriptures. But God has something better better in Jesus. And that is really the theme of this entire book. And the theme of our message today is that what you thought was good about God is better in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the better we have in Christ and let us receive it today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So before you're seated, would you turn to somebody, give them a big smile, let them know that they're welcome today and that you like them and that they're awfully nice. Yeah. There you go. If you're online, here's your smile for you today. It's a privilege to see you online. All right. 
So the definition of better is of a more excellent or effective type or quality. That doesn't mean much. So what I thought I'd do is I'd give us some pictures to help us define better. Is that all right with you? All right, so there you go. That's good. Come on, as a kid, anybody, that's better, right? Come on. All right, here we go. Here's the next one. Good, good, right? A dollar's good, right? This is better. Oh, yeah, that's better. How about this one? All right, you ready? This is actually a beach on Lake Erie, and I like this beach. It's a nice little beach. But it, it is prone to have some stuff floating in the water and the rocks and gravels and that kind of stuff. So I thought I'd get you a picture of better. Yeah. All right, all right. Now we got one more. We got one more. This is good if you need to get to work, right? It's good. Correct? But, but come on. Can this be, be Can you get better? Oh, yeah, there's better. My dream car right there. That's it. All right, so God's plan is good, but in Jesus we get better. So the book of Hebrews presents three ways that Jesus is better. Three ways Jesus is better. I'm going to walk through the text today, and uh, we're going to look at three statements about how Jesus is better. The first one is Jesus is a better priest. Jesus is a better priest. Now the letter opens by recognizing in the past God was good, and God gave us good words, but there's a better way. And he describes this to us, and it is a beautiful introduction. It's in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, and many times in various ways. So we had God talking through humans in the past. And we have the scriptures, and those scriptures, God talking to us in the past. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So God was talking to us through people in the past. Now he's talking to us himself. This is good stuff. God communicated through the scriptures, but now he communicates through himself, through Jesus Christ. By the way, Jesus said this about the scriptures, the Old Testament law. He said in John 5, 39, he said, you diligently study the scriptures because you think from them you have eternal life. But these are the scriptures that testify about me. So why don't you come to me and live? That's what he encouraged them. So in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Now, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. So God's glory is like the sun, and, and Jesus is like the, the light that comes out of the sun, the brightness, the radiance of the sun. And the exact representation of his being. Now, those words, exact representation, I thought of a way to try to figure out. You know, in the Greek, it says the, the perfect character of God. And I was like, how can I show an exact representation, perfect character of God? So I have one of these in my office. What this is, is this is a plate that somebody bought me from a forge. And uh, at the forge, they have a press. And the press is a piece of metal that um, they'll take this, this piece of metal and they'll put it on top of the press. And then I'm not sure if you can see the hammer marks in it, but they'll take a hammer and they'll beat it while this is slightly heated up. They'll beat this into a place where the very, the very image that was on the press is impressed upon this plate. This is an exact representation of what was on that, that mold, an exact representation of what was on the mold. And that's what this word, actually, the exact representation means that we, and when we look at Jesus, we see the actual real character of who God is. So if you ever wonder what God's character looks like and what his dealings look like, you would look at God because God is the exact, uh, exactly represented in Jesus Christ. The exact, actually the Greek word is literally character of his being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so he became as much superior or better to the angels as the name he has inherited is theirs. So Jesus is the character and the exact representation of who God is. And Jesus, that makes Jesus a better priest. Now, what's the purpose of a priest? A priest is someone that reaches up and grabs a hold of God and reaches down and grabs a hold of humanity and stands in the gap in between and intercedes 
for the problems of humanity to God. And that's what a priest's job is, is to stand in the middle and make intercession. So Jesus is a better priest because he's not limited in his approach to God. Uh, in Hebrews, they're going to talk about how a priest, the high priest in the Old Testament, only entered the presence of God once a year, and only then he made one sacrifice, and then he'd have to make the exact same sacrifice again and again and again and again. And the writer of Hebrews is going to draw a comparison about how those were uh, offerings that were presented over and over, but Jesus only presented one offering once, and that was good enough for everybody all time. So in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11, it says if the, the old priesthood, if perfection would have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, let's stop and talk about that for a second. Levitical priesthood, so when Abraham had a son, and then Abraham's son had a son, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. These became the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those 12 tribes was the Levites, and Moses was a Levite, and Aaron was a Levite, and when Moses got the law from God, the Levites were turned into the priests. They were the made the priests. They were given no inheritance and property outside of a few cities to shelter people. They were given no way to make income outside of, of uh, presenting uh, offerings and, and standing between God and man. So their job, an entire tribe, their entire lives were dedicated to the worship of God and standing between the Israelites and God. And that was the Levitical priesthood. And, and what the writer of Hebrews is saying is if perfection would have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, Indeed, the law given to the people and established that priesthood, why was there still a need for another priest to come who was after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron or the Levites? And what he's saying is, is there is a priesthood. Remember what the story we read, we read earlier about how there was this priest named Melchizedek that Abraham actually made a sacrifice through Melchizedek to God? Remember that? What's funny is, is the writer of Hebrews is drawing out that, you know, Abraham still had, you know, in his body, uh, the sons that would become sons that would become sons that eventually would become the Levites. So he says, even Abraham, our father, was paying a tithe to this priest Melchizedek. And even Levites who collect the tithe in the law were paying the tithe because there's a better priest and that better priest is a priest like Melchizedek that has no beginning, no ending. We don't know anything about his beginning and end. All we know is that he was the king of peace. Come on, the prince of peace. He was the king of peace, and we know he was a priest of most high God, and we know that he brought the body and the wine, the blood and the, the bread as a sign of how he was a part of the covenant. So, if, um, if indeed the law was given to the people established a priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one after the order of Melchizedek, not the order of Aaron? So the point of this is, is that the, the law could not bring you into a right relationship with God. So God had to find a different priest in a different way. And Abraham, or I'm sorry, and Jesus is that better priest. Hebrews 5, 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petition, fervent cries. Remember this? He offered up prayers, a lot of prayers, petitions, and fervent cries, and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. So Jesus Christ, the best priest, is heard because of submission. Son though he was, he learned what? Can, can I get the next slide? Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Hold on. Jesus himself, the perfect priest, the perfect son of God, the exact representation of God himself had to suffer on this earth and his suffering was a way that he learned obedience. Now, I know that there's this view of Christianity out there that once you pray the prayer, you get saved. Everything's going to be perfect from then on and everything that comes your way You're going to win it immediately and you're never going to have to suffer and life is going to be awesome I know there's that view out there But I want to ask you a question if Jesus himself God's perfect representation Had to suffer on this earth and had to learn some obedience and had to go through some difficulties What makes you think you're any better than him? 
maybe the things you're going through are eventually we do always win in Christ. Eventually we do always win. But notice I said eventually. Sometimes you've got to suffer through some stuff. Sometimes you've got to learn some obedience as you're going through the hard time. And if Jesus, the perfect representation of God, had to do that, you probably will too. And once he was made perfect, can you turn me up and I'm going to lower my voice a little bit. And once he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Once again, a Melchizedek priest, one that's not based upon the law, but one that's based upon an eternal place of priesthood. And why, why is Jesus so good as our priest? Ephes, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Come on. Jesus was tempted in every way like you are. Just, there's one difference between you and him. He never sinned. And because he never sinned, he overcame and he always won. And, and he understands your temptations. He understands your struggles. He understands your trials. He understands and he can tell you since he made it, you can make it too. You can make it too. Hebrews 7, 25, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always leaves. He always lives to do what? Even now in heaven, Jesus is interceding for you. He's got a hold of you. He's got a hold of God's presence and he's standing there interceding for you, always living to intercede for you. Now, I thought about different ways to talk about this and, and I thought I'd just show you a little real quick video that'll help you understand what it means to be a priest and to stand in the gap and to help somebody in their time of trouble and difficulty. And now to honor America and salute the men and women serving our country with our national anthem, please welcome, as voted by you, the fans, our winner of the Toyota Get the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert. That's a perfect example of a priest. In the moment of weakness and failure, the priest comes alongside, throws his arm around his shoulder, and joins you in the struggle and encourages you that you can make it. But did you notice something else? Did you notice when Mo Cheeks, that was Mo Cheeks, the, the coach of the, uh, the Seattle Seahawks, when Mo Cheeks started doing like this, what was he encouraging everybody to do? Come on, everybody join along. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And what Jesus is doing in heaven, he's not only interceding, grabbing a hold of God and grabbing a hold of you and saying we can make it. He's saying to everybody in heaven that succeeded in the years gone by, come on, let's celebrate them. They can do it. They can do it. Join them, encourage them in their run. Aren't you glad we got a better priest? 
Aren't you glad we got someone that cares, that knows what it's like to be embarrassed, that comes alongside you in your moment of weakness and encourages you and takes the pressure off of you so that you can make it? Come on. And second of all, we got better promises. Now, the Old Testament law gave us promises that were contingent upon obedience to the vows we've made. Now, at Harvest Ridge, we, we explain the understanding of why Christ died in, from a book of Hebrews point of view and, and what I believe is a New Testament point of view is that the, here's, here's what happened is um, the law was given and the law was a covenant. And how you made a covenant was you would take an animal, you would cut the animal in half, you would lay half over here, you would lay half over here, and you would then make your vows. I promise to do or, or how about this one? I pledge to love you and honor you and keep you in sickness and in health and forsaking all others. Keep myself only unto you as long as we both shall live. How about that one? That's a covenant. That's the vow that's made. So the, the animal was split in half and the blood was in the middle. And after you made your promises, you walk through the animal and say, if I break my covenant, may I be dead and my blood be spilled like this animal. And that's how a covenant was made. Well, when the covenant of the law was made, the, the people said, we will obey every part of this law. And if they didn't obey every part of that law, then that means, guess what? They were going to be dead. Well, that covenant of the law, when it included us, it meant that all of us who break any of the 613 commands in the Old Testament, any of us, we're condemned to death. And the Apostle Paul says that none of us could keep the law. The law was just a school teacher to show us how lost we were. And we're all in trouble if we try to obey the law. And, 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 you know, the wages of sin is death. So what God did is God chose to put an end to the law by coming and dying. And when Jesus died that day on the cross, he completed, fulfilled, put an end to the covenant. It's no longer necessary. It has been fulfilled because God, who cannot die, Die, died to show that this law is done with. Now, there were promises in that covenant of the law. And those covenants were, you know, if you keep my words and you do what I say, then I'll bless you. The problem is none of us have been able to keep those laws. None of us can. And the Bible tells us that the wages of those sins are death. But we have a new covenant a new covenant in Jesus. When Jesus died upon the cross, he not only fulfilled that covenant and put an end to that covenant, he established a new covenant with us. I, I, I know y'all are looking at me like, really? You're telling me that the covenant of the law is fulfilled and over and I don't have to live by it? Absolutely. Absolutely. We embrace the morality of the law, but we don't embrace all of the details of the law because if you're wearing any clothing today like a cotton polyester mix like this one. I am breaking the law. Right? I can't live that way. And I'm definitely going to eat a cheeseburger. <laughs> right? So what, what happens is, is that God wanted to make a better law, a better covenant with us, with better vows and better promises that are not dependent on you. You never have to say, I will keep this or I will die. You simply have to trust in what Jesus has already done for you. This is, that's better promises, right? All right. So Hebrews seven eighteen. the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. The former regulation being the law. In case you're, you're wondering, he says, for the law made nothing perfect. But we have a we have a what? We have a better hope is introduced by which we can draw near to God. He became, Jesus became a priest with an oath. <laughs> so that, here's the vow. When God said to him, the Lord is sworn will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. A better covenant. We get a better covenant, one of God's blessings. And all we have to do is trust and live in it. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But, the, but in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old one. So the old covenant had a problem. So the new covenant is established on, once again, on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, whoa, did, did y'all read this? Those of you still trying to live by the law and, yeah, 
If there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God, there was a problem with the old covenant. The problem is you. But God found fault with the people. But God found fault with who? That's you. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Am I correct? But hold on, hold on. Listen to the rest of that verse. And are justified freely by his grace through the new covenant of Jesus. Come on. God doesn't just want to punish. He wants to give you a new future based upon a better covenant. But God found fault with the people and he said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people and I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts and they will be my God and I, I, I will be their God and they will be my people. And notice there's a blessing of this new covenant, Hebrews 9, 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God Cleanse our consciences. Anybody ever have a guilty conscience in this room? Anybody ever have a guilty conscience for something you didn't even do wrong? Yeah, and a guilty conscience for something you didn't even do wrong, you sort of sabotaged yourself. Anybody ever done anything like that? Yeah, I have. I understand. Yeah, you get a guilty conscience. Anybody ever a guilty conscience for something you did wrong and you sabotaged yourself? Yeah, I got three up here. I'll put the fourth one up too. There. Y'all know what I'm talking about? A guilty conscience is a bad thing because if you live with a guilty conscience, you can never actually live right because you're always trying to make up for something that happened before. But you know what Jesus does? This is a part of his new covenant with us. He not only forgives us and cleanses us and washes us and gives us a new hope and a new future, he also cleanses our consciences from all those acts that led to death so that we can actually serve God today. We're not living yesterday. We can live today. Somebody ought to shout amen about that. You don't have to live with your yesterdays. So, um, and for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive a promised eternal inheritance. God has an inheritance for you for all eternity, for all time, and it is a good blessing, and he wants you to enter into it. And then Hebrews 10, 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Come on, how many times did Jesus die? Once and for who? All, everybody. Once for all, day after day, a priest though would stand and perform his religious duties again and again. He had offered the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, when Jesus, this priest had offered for one time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God for by one sacrifice he has made perfect. How long? Forever. Those who are being made holy. Man, I wish I had time for that. But God's given us a bunch of promises promises here. What do you do when you get promises? I have illustrations. I'm not going to use those illustrations. I'm going to give you one more scripture. Y'all ready? It's in first Corinthians or second Corinthians chapter one, verse 20. And it says, for no matter how many promises God are made, they are yes in Christ Jesus. And through him, we say what? Amen. amen. What does amen mean? So be it. I agree with it. So be it. I agree. So God has made all these promises in Jesus that you don't have to live yesterdays. You don't have to live in condemnation. You don't have to live with your guilty conscience. You can now walk in freedom and clarity and honesty and integrity. You can walk in the ability to make right instead of living in your wrong. Come on. God has gave you all of these. You know all you need to do to it? All you need to do is say, what? I got three people that got that. Come on, what do you need to say to walk into that? You need to say, so be it, God, I accept it. You need to say what? Amen. How many of you want that freedom in your life? Come on, you want that freedom. You want to walk with your, yesterday doesn't keep you from living today. Come on then, I think we ought to say it together. One more time, you ready? What is our response to all of God's wonderful promises? Amen, Amen. so be it, God. All right, so third thing is we have better privileges in Jesus. We got better privileges. And since we have these promises, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way open through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, since all these things are ours, let us. Now, I call these my salad sermons. Because a salad is sometimes good for you, right? 
And what's the first thing you need on any salad? It's not a salad until you get some lettuce. lettuce. So he's going off with some lettuce. So I call these salad sermons. Now, a good salad, though, they're going to need some stuff on top of it because just, no, 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 don't. I need some real carrots. Come on. I, I need some. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, you got to have dressing on there. You can't let us just eat lettuce, right? <laughs> All right, so let's look at what we're here to do. What are we to let us do? First is, we're to let us draw near to God. You know, since God isn't pushing you away, why don't you draw near to him? The best part of this, the healthiest part of this is let us draw near to God. Come on, why don't you take some time in your day where instead of looking at Facebook or watching the news or whatever it is that you do that wastes your time, and I know you do it, everybody in this room, you waste your time somewhere. It's Instagram or Facebook or maybe Snapchat or TikTok or TikTok or an hour later, TikTok. How about, we, how about we do this? Let us draw near to God. Let us draw near to God. Let's draw near to God. Spend some time seeking him, getting to know him, looking at the scriptures. If you can't do anything else, read the book of Matthew and, and, or Luke and, and just draw near to God. Spend some time in prayer. Let it speak to you. Let us draw near to God. Spend some time in prayer. Take 10 minutes where you shut off all noise and you just listen to God. Try it. Try it. You will come away a whole lot more refreshed than you are from your TikToks because they, they are not feeding your soul. They are... Anyway, don't get me started. Also, maybe you want to take Saturday mornings at 830 and come join us for prayer. We meet here. And if you want to pray in this church at any time, just call the office. We will open up the doors for you. My goodness. If you want to spend time in prayer, I invite you. You can come here if you can't focus at home. Well, then come by here and we'll, we'll open up the doors and let you pray. All right. Second of all, hold fast to our faith. Let us hold fast to our faith. Let us hold un unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. So we got to hold unswervingly. Come on, unswervingly means that you're not pushed this way and you're not pushed that way and you're not pushed this way or that way. Depending, this friend talks to you, I swerve over here. This friend talks to me, I swerve over here. This friend says this, or I watch this, or I hear this, or this situation happens, or that situation happens. I'm always swerving down the road. Come on, how many of you know it's dangerous to swerve, right? Yeah. Hold unswervingly to the truth we profess and the hope we profess. Next one. Uh, let us consider how we may spur one another on to good deeds, love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. Let us consider how we can spur one another on. That's the reason we're doing man church. We want to spur one another along. Now, now spur, I find that word interesting because I used to ride horses. And, you know, you'd go, let's go. And sometimes the horses would pay attention. Sometimes they wouldn't. Now, I never wore spurs, but I tell you what you could do when the horse wouldn't listen and he wouldn't listen to the shake of the reins or the in your voice, you know what you'd have to do? You'd have to take your heel and dig your heel into his flank and the horse would say, oh, it's time to move. And some of us, we're so stubborn, God's saying to us, come on, let's go. God's saying, and he's even shaking some reins in your life and you need a brother or sister in Christ to come up to you, give you a good kick in the ribs and say, you are not acting right. And that's why we have the body of Christ. By the way, let me say one thing about this fellowship of the saints. This is a safe place for you to be different than the world. I don't think you understand that. You can't be safe at your workplace following the commands and love of God. You can't be safe. You've got to always be on your guard no matter where you go. You, can't, you cannot go on Facebook and be safe. You cannot, you cannot live in your community and be safe. You will be attacked, but I want this to be a place where we know that God's word stands supreme and where God's love is first. And we will love one another and we will stand loyal to Jesus Christ no matter what. <laughs> the next thing is you need to get rid of sin. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, this is one of my favorite stories. I was coaching football back in the day, and this was a little kid league. This is a little kid, little kid league, all right? They were like eight, nine, ten years. I think they were like 10 or 11. And uh, the kid's name was Ryan. And uh, Ryan never wanted to wear his belt. Now, the Bible calls belt the belt of truth. Okay, so I'm going to draw a comparison here. But he never wanted to wear his belt, so his pants were always sagging, right? So Ryan was our tailback. 
So one day we handed the ball to Ryan. Ryan broke around the end and he is free. He's got the ball in his hand and he's taken off down the field and he's running and he's headed for the end zone. Nobody's going to catch him because Ryan is fast and he's cruising down the field. And about that time, his pants start sagging. Come on. And he's running like this. His boxers are shining, his pants are going lower, and he's running down the field. And I'm like, I'm watching a touchdown disappear in front of me as he's like this. And eventually they sag so low, he literally trips up. And when he trips, about the time a kid hits him, and he gets knocked out of bounds about 10 yards from the end zone. He could have scored. But let me tell you, something was entangling him from running because he wasn't embracing the truth he got all caught up in the lies of, no, come on. Let us throw off everything that hinders. Let us deal with anything that's going to trip us up. And the sin, not a sin, come on. God's not worried about a sin. You got, you got 5,000 a sins, but that's just, that's just a part of living. You know what God's really concerned about? The sin in your life. And you know what it is when I say the sin, you know what it is, you know exactly what it is. And God says, let's deal with that and get you over that and get rid of that in your life so that you can win. Let us deal with the sin that trips you up so that you can live in confidence. I got some testimony there, but I'm not going to do it. Hebrews 12, 2. One, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing the eyes, our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Come on, let's focus. Let's focus on Jesus. Because whatever relationship you're in right now, it's going to end. But there's one relationship that's never going to end. And that is the relationship you have with Jesus. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the one that we get to spend eternity with. And all of the blessings of heaven and God and everything God's ever imagined that's good, he's better. Let us stay focused. Don't get tripped up by the craziness. And this faith will allow you to do something. It will allow you to know that God's going to come through for you. Two passages about faith because there's a lot about faith there in chapter 11 and 12. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. The, we can be assured of what we do not see. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So what is faith? Faith is me living as if I really believe what God said. I got two stories for you, then I'm done, all right? First story is a guy named Rees Howells. He was a missionary. Rees Howells was a missionary that ran a, um, an orphanage. And um, he, he ran by faith. He never once asked for money. He ran by faith, and God would always give him money to take care of his, uh, his situation. And that was what, early in his ministry, God told him, this is to be your rule. You never ask. So um, one day, he needed to travel by train, him and a companion, to get back to his orphanage, and he had no money. So he's praying, and he's like, God, I have no money. And God said, what would you do? What would you do if you had money? And he said, well, I'd go get in line, wait for my ticket. And God said, act like it. So by faith, he went, he got in line, because faith is the substance of what we hope for, the evidence of what we do not see. He believed God would provide for him, so he just acted like it. He went and got in line. He's waiting in line, waiting in line, waiting in line. Nothing happening, nothing happening, nothing happening, nothing happening. Finally, he's like the next one, and he's about to get called forward. And some guy came up and said, I can't wait any longer. Shoved some money in his hand and walked away. And he said that taught him something. It taught him that God would always meet when God directs. Because by faith, we act as though we already have the promise. One more story. It was 1980. And I was, uh, I was a teenager. It was 1980. And uh, the, the United States was, had a hockey team that was playing in uh, the hockey tournament of the Olympics. 
And they were doing good. They were the youngest team, by the way. They were the youngest, and they were playing against the Russians that Sunday afternoon. I remember it. I was at church. We came home from church, and we watched it on Wide World of Sports. Anybody remember that? And I was watching the game that day when the Americans, by the way, the Russians had won five of the last six Olympic events. They were the best hockey team in the world. They were all paid professionals. There there were a bunch of college players on the American team. There was no way they could win. They were the underdog of underdogs. And the 80, 1980 was a rough year. If anybody remembers of Jimmy Carter and all the stuff that was going on around the world, it was a rough year. And we were feeling down as Americans and we're watching this. And there comes a glimmer of hope that we might be able to play against the Russians. And we start in first, uh, first period, second period, we're holding our own. We're actually up by two. It comes to the final period. The United States is up five to four. And I remember watching this. Me and my brother, we're like every play. We're, I, we don't even like hockey. We're from Oklahoma. And we're like shoving each other. And, and we're like screaming and jumping and yelling at the TV because America is about to win. And we were so tense because we expected, you know, the Russians to like score. And then they pulled their goalie out. And, and we knew that the, the victory was imminent. And we screamed and yelled and danced around the house because... Because the United States won. Now, that was a very, very tense game for me. But a couple years ago, I saw this movie called Miracle on Ice. Anybody remember that movie? So I saw the movie, and it's the story of the 1980 Olympic hockey team. And I will tell you, not once during that movie was I the least bit tense about America. Even when they were making it tense in the movie, I was never tense about America winning. Do you know why? Because I already knew the end of the game. Oh, I don't think you got that. I don't think you got that. By faith, we know the end of the game. We know that whatever we're in, wherever we're going through, whatever whatever happens on this earth, whoever is in the White House or your house, Jesus is in the real house. He is Lord. We don't have to live with some fear or doubt. We get better privileges. We know the end of the book, man. We have read the end of the book and Jesus always wins. So I don't live today as if it's not going to work out because I serve a risen Savior. He is in the world today. I know he's living no matter what men may say. Come on. He is alive. He is alive. He is the victor. He is the triumph. And that's better than living like everybody else. I don't think you got that. All your buddies at school and work, they're not living better. You get a chance to live better by faith in Jesus Christ, who is your priest. And if you ever have need, he's going to step up, throw his arm around you and sing your way through it with you. I I feel like I'm preaching to the wall here. Guys, listen to me. Jesus gives us everything we need. You just need to trust it and walk in it. And I don't care if you're going through the fire or you're going through the victory. Today, Jesus is with you. He is a priest that has given you better privileges and better promises, and he is worthy of praise. Could we just stand and sing this song like